Welcome to another episode of the Carry Trainer Higher Line Podcast. Hey all, welcome to yet another episode of the Carry Trainer Higher Line Podcast. I have hunted down a constitutional scholar of sorts, a professor, uh, Miss Johnston, out of Salt Lake City. I started to fixate on where you lived previously, and you've got a doctorate in political science? That's right. But kind of what I found online is you, you seems to be that you specialize in things related to the Constitution? Yeah. American political right. thought constitutionalism. Yeah. Say that one more time. That was a big mouthful of stuff. Oh, uh, American political thought and constitutionalism. Put that into like a paragraph for me. Right. So I study uh, what is uniquely American in political philosophy, uh, the founding era and its ideas, and uh, with a particular emphasis on the U.S. Constitution and how to interpret it. Hmm. That's so that that can be probably a point to argue all kinds of things. The courts can't agree on stuff. Uh, the two sides of the aisle in Congress can't agree on stuff. Why is it not so cut and dry and black and white when it's on the paper? Oh, because the Constitution is actually very vaguely written and intentionally so. So it's uh, there are so many things that are actually meant to be debated over that uh, there's no real clear meaning on. There are some things that are very, very clear. And then there are some things, for example, uh, later edition, when you get the Bill of Rights, you have uh, the, the two component clauses of freedom of religion. How do you interpret those? Well, so much of it has to be interpreted culturally and in the moment. They didn't like lay out an interpretation for you. It's like a sentence to, uh, to govern so much of American political life. So uh, we're supposed to fight over it. That's politics. Hmm. I've always always told that politics was like the theater of government. Is so to a PhD professor, what's a what is politics? I guess let's let's start there. Ooh, I think it's the way we argue over how to live together. I like politics hmm. because it's politics, or, or you can kill each other. So I like politics as a way to decide how we're going to live together. I've got so many questions I, before I even dig into them. And I, I, I think that's probably the best answer I've ever heard. I like that. It's completely different than my interpretation of the word politics, having worked in party politics. Like I see it from like a business standpoint, you know, like the nuts and bolts and the mechanisms of how parties wrangle people together and stack a, like the, the bench i've heard people say like a baseball team like minor leagues you know and bringing them up to get them into federal offices and stuff so like i see that mechanism in my head i actually don't like it i think it's a, a crummy way of doing things but that's my two cents what would make a person so you've got what 20 something years of education uh from grade school on to get a, get to a phd why go down this this narrow path why not be a medical doctor or a engineer or a scientist now and i have no issue i'm just wondering what would get, make you so passionate about it yeah so i can actually give you the moment it was uh sarah palin's address at the 2008 republican national convention i had uh i had never seen i guess i'd never seen a woman in politics before she came on in like a i think it was like a red suit she had a joke about a uh what is it, a pit bull with lipstick on or something like that? And I was really just uh, just taken. And then in the mornings, my dad would listen to, you know, talk radio or this or that. And we'd talk about things. And Like uh, Rush Limbaugh or something? Yeah, or Glenn Beck or, or whatever. And uh, over the years, my, my views have changed, but it all, uh, it all comes back to Sarah Palin in 2008. I think I was in fifth or sixth grade or something. And just, uh, I just knew from that moment on, there was nothing else I wanted to study. So as a 12 year old, 10 year old, you saw this lady, Alaska's governor at the time and thought, this is cool. Politics yes. is cool. Yeah. Yeah. And then I created, uh, in my, my childhood bedroom, I had a, a wall of, of presidents that I just like printed off all the pictures 
and tape them on the wall next to my bed. And then as I learn more and dislike some of them, I'd like tear them down until I had Don't just take the this the wrong I way, but you were a dork. <laughs> okay. So my little brother, Steven, my parents had 11 kids can to this day name every president in order with their uh, vice president. And I know when he was younger, he could name like secretary of states and all that stuff. He had memorized oh. all that stuff. Yeah. Oh, uh, I could not have done that. I couldn't have know. done that. So you'd find out something new about a president and be like, oh, he was horrible. I'm no longer, he's no longer allowed on the wall. Yeah. A lot of it was party affiliated at that point. And so I would tear them down until I just had the presidents that I liked. And then I'd add some modern politicians that I liked. And, and it worked out because I had uh, parents who had very set political views, but who let me think whatever I wanted and explore ideas. And, and uh, I think I've always been trying to understand politics, trying to understand what, what is this thing we're doing? What is the truth of it, of it if there is any truth to it? I've just been uh, interested in that puzzle my entire life. You've been at it a while. So I'm a martial artist. So I, you would be considered a black belt. Like you're a black belt in political science, right? You spent all these years learning this thing. So now people come to you and you teach them. And usually in martial arts, when somebody gets a black belt, they will say, now I realize I don't know anything. Like I've learned <laughs> enough to realize that there's so much I don't know. Do you feel that way at all? Oh, absolutely. I tell my husband all the time that with every passing year, I feel more confused mm -hmm. and less certain of my views, less convinced. I, uh, I guess I've been searching for some kind of clarity or, or concrete opinion, and I just keep slipping further away from it. Uh, let's uh, let me dig into that. So on what, like a particular topic, or are you trying to create this like global view of America in like the framework of our government in your head? Like, what is this thing that you're trying to wrap your head around? Well, I, I'm not sure we can really separate politics from everything else that we think about. I think uh, we have universal worldviews and everything kind of fits into it. Okay. And as more information comes in, the component parts have to change, right? The solar system gets moved around a little bit. Um, so it's certainly about policy issues, certainly about how to understand the Constitution, how to understand the founding, but also what society should look like today, what I want from politics today. I, uh, it's exactly what, as you said, I am less convinced than I have ever been that I'm right. Give me an argument, start with something. What are you trying to be right on? I wanna understand, so you, you teach this stuff, right? Yeah, so yeah, like, well, okay, so here's an example. Yeah. Here's an example that I've been wrestling with. <clears throat> Well, I'll give you two examples. One, how do you understand the American political project, especially in light of some of the really painful compromises that were made regarding slavery at the founding? Mm. So how do I view the founding? Was it this kind of city on a hill, lightning in the bottle moment? Was it doomed from the beginning, a, a project that was never about liberty and only about supremacy, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I think my view on that has just gotten more uh, nuanced. Another way, how do I interpret the U.S. Constitution? How much should it govern affairs today? Part of that is how much can you actually interpret this document that was written, you know, 200 plus years ago? and uh, is often very uh, vague about what it wants, but also we need some common basis in which to govern political life. And also what role does a written constitution have in what is essentially a people's government? It is the people's constitution, but how do you preserve reverence for that constitution while also allowing for change? These are the kind of things that I, I think I'm less certain on uh, than I was before. I think that maybe you're my sister from another mother. <laughs> I cut the grass and I think about these things. I uh, I told you before we began recording, I have visited not all, but if you can think of a significantly or historically significant site in our founding, I probably have been there. Um, and it's not like 
like I'm checking boxes. I want to go see the places like, like the first time I walked through the portico at, um, uh, Fort Ticonderoga and read the plaque that said through this hall past, and then it's got the names of, you know, Washington and Knox and these men, you're like, holy crap, like I'm actually standing there. It, it's, it's such an interesting thing that w what you just talked about, I, I'll pose a question or maybe a thought. The point that I've always come back to is something the founders talked about often, which was civic virtue. This idea of of virtue is that is that does that play a role? Or did I've heard some people say they only said that like like a like a corrupt CEO of a company talks about um, being uh, ecologically uh, uh, efficient in in like living a certain way because it's good for the planet, and then that CEO jumps on an airplane and zips all over the world to do horrible things and you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. No. And I think the answer to that is no. Um, no, it, it wasn't, uh, or I should say, yes, they were really serious about it. I look at John Adams, who's my very favorite founding father, by the way. He's very serious about civic virtue. And it's something that really haunts me is this idea of uh, uh, liberty and virtue. These are flip sides of the same coin. They they need each other. You know, it, you're not... Uh, uh, virtue without agency or liberty isn't truly virtuous. It's just you're being forced, you're doing it because there's a gun to your head. And liberty without uh, virtue is anarchy. You need these two things. And they were very clear about this. You can have a constitutional system, but if you don't have a people capable of self-government, you will require a bigger, uh, more dictatorial government to be your parent because you are incapable of governing yourself. So civic virtue is, uh, it's an ancient concept. All the fl political philosophers have understood how important this is and how very difficult it is to inculcate it, particularly over generations. Why don't we talk about it anymore? Why is it oh. not at, a, at a, a grade school level? I mean, what does it even mean in the, t in the time you brought up it's an ancient thought the romans talked about it the greeks talked about it the philosophers like plato and all of all of that ilk and then modern day not modern but modern at the time of the founding Locke and those men spoke of these things what happened where was there a a change i think uh, a, an ugly side of liberalism is what happened to that. Liberalism is hyper-focused on rights, which is important. That's an important component of it. But at some point, the uh, virtue part, the Republican part, and I mean small r Republican, not the party, kind of mm -hmm. disappeared from political discourse. And we became a country hyper-obsessed with rights and freedoms and understanding of happiness as freedom. Whereas I think in the founding generation, it was understood that the purpose of freedom was to be uh, happy, which was understood as moral excellence. So the purpose of freedom is moral excellence. And uh, I, somewhere that got lost, I don't know, 1960s, I don't know when this got lost, but we don't talk about it anymore. And, and we certainly have lost a lot of those civic institutions because I'm not convinced you can do this via government. But a lot of these civics institu civic institutions, your churches, your families, mm. your anywhere else your bowling leagues i don't care boy scouts all that stuff boy scouts where civic virtue is is taught that's gone and now we're deeply atomized and rights focused you earlier brought up this juxtaposition that you've had in your head between the founders in the this is where this goes every time to me uh, I can sit and write volumes as as these guys did on virtue, but then I can own a person at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that's where it like all, always unravels in my own head. And I know that oftentimes we just are like, well, that was just like at the time that was normal. So we just do that. Like, I don't know if I understand judging through the optics of today is we can't, it's hard, hard to do if you look at what, scientists did in the 1500s we think that they're dumb and stupid and ignorant because they didn't have 
microscopes and and all of that but i don't was there ever a time in history that people didn't think it was bad to subjugate a people and make them do work for oh, free yeah. and <laughs> That's the vast majority of human history. It was understood as completely fine because there was no concept of universal rights or universal peoplehood. And by the way, this is one reason I love John Adams is because he he is a child of the Enlightenment and uh, and and didn't have that same kind of uh, split in his thought between civic virtue and freedom and liberal ideas and owning people. Benjamin Franklin is another example of this. So you have your Thomas Jeffersons. But you also have your John Adams, who, by the way, is just fundamentally important to the construction of the U.S. Constitution. Sure. And then there's George Washington's, who had very nuanced understandings of slavery, and uh, many of his decisions were kind of caged in by by uh, laws in the state of Virginia, but who wouldn't have said it was moral. So this is, uh, it's it's nuanced, but also, yeah, Thomas Jefferson, I'm happy to just say, go away, Thomas. Really? He, so you as a, a scholar would just wipe away this founder? Well, I wouldn't wipe him away, but I do prefer to ignore him more and elevate people like John Adams more. <laughs> I guess if we have to, who are we going to talk about here? Who is our like founding father? Okay, John Adams, or not John Adams, Thomas Jefferson. Yes, I get that he wrote the Declaration of Independence. He wasn't at the Constitutional Convention. It's one of the best things that ever happened to the document. He wasn't uh, a particularly uh, uh, good president in terms of consistency of thought. Uh, so I I acknowledge what he did. But if I want to talk about the founders, I'm going to talk about founders who I think matter more, like John Adams hmm. and George Washington. I dig that. I dig that. I was You're talking about Jefferson and something you said a moment ago. I had to look up the exact quote so I didn't butcher it. But it's um, Jefferson. I believe he was talking to... James Madison via letter. And the question whether one generation of men has a right to bind another seems never to have been started either on this or our side, on this or our side of the water, but between society and society. So he goes on, you know where this goes. Every constitution then and every law naturally expires at the end of 19 years. He's talking about the earth belongs to the living, right? I think they skipped the important part similar ground it may be proved that no society can make a perpetual constitution or even a perpetual law and the earth belongs always to the living generation and i know he wrote on that stuff numerous times maybe like at that point in his life he was like what have we done or like i, I don't it seems rather interesting and and you brought up adams numerous times i believe he talked about this multiple times as well well, one thing that Jefferson is talking about here is how difficult it is to amend the U.S. Constitution. He was quite grumpy about it when he uh, he's in France and he gets a copy, hears about it, and is like, why is this so difficult to amend? You know, the tree of liberty must be continually watered by the blood of patriots, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and James Madison's basic response is, look, man, we've just had a decade of revolution. We need stability. And the way to get stability is reverence for the law. And you revere things that don't change easily. And also, there's something about the governance of the ancestors, the collective wisdom of the ages. So there's uh, Jefferson. Uh, Jefferson's view on this, can one generation govern another, is, is largely no. But Madison's is, we need stability. And stability comes from time. And, and uh, why discard everything that previous generations have learned your tone changes when you talk about jefferson you don't like him at all oh sorry. <laughs> i can hear it i can hear it let's change gears a little bit because we're kind of just talking like uh, uh broad broad stuff uh are we a republic or are we a democracy or are we both i, know I don't like low this level question. stuff for, i know you yeah don't. Oh, I would. Yeah, you? I no, yeah, 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 yeah. No, this isn't, and that's not a criticism of you. I just generally don't like this question because I think it's a bad faith effort to uh, mm. to say votes don't matter. I don't like that. So when we talk about a republic, we're talking about a representative democracy. So no, you don't go out and vote directly, but you vote for representatives who vote or uh, who vote uh, on your behalf. We make decisions by majorities in this country. Period. A majority in the Senate. A majority in the House. 
a majority of electoral college votes to get the president. We make decisions by majorities and that that's democracy. We're just a representative democracy. So people could say we're a democratic we're a republic we're a republic or a democracy. I don't care. We make decisions via majorities. We just do it via representative institutions. Should we abolish that and just go to a general vote, count them all up? Oh, because of like technological advancements, like everyone sure. get out your phone and vote on everything. Some people talk about this. I don't think it would work out well, actually. Uh, no, I like representative democracy most of the time. Why? Like, why, why did they do it? Why did they create the Electoral College? Why not just have all of the citizens go cast a piece of paper in their local town and add it up? Even then they could have done it because the population was so small. Why did they do that? Well, uh, yes and no. I think first two different questions. First, why representative democracy? And Madison yes. makes this very clear in the Federalist Papers that representative democracy has two advantages over direct democracy that may allow the American system to survive where previous democratic experiments have failed. And the first is that you can, in a representative democracy, give a lot of decision making over to wise and justice loving representatives but you also get to vote them out if you don't like what they're doing. So maybe you elevate the decision-making capacity. And just in case that doesn't work, just in case you're still selecting boneheads, you can reduce the power of factions, of majorities through sheer diversity. You can extend the size of the Republic and make it bigger and more diverse. And the bigger and more diverse something is, the more types are involved, the harder it is to form majorities, which could oppress minorities. Uh, this is another advantage of representative democracies. And of course, that's kind of negated by modern technology. And the second question goes to why the Electoral College? I actually love this. They they were just, they really didn't know how to solve this question at the convention. They kept on coming back to it. How do we elect the president? And the big question was, well, do you give it to Congress? No, you can't let Congress elect the president because then you've completely violated separation of powers. They will control the president. Can't mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. Do you give it to a direct vote? James Wilson actually brought this up at the convention and it was kind of like Ooh, uh, a direct vote. Do we really trust the people to not just select the first demagogue who comes along? This seems like a bad idea. So the Electoral College was kind of a compromise position. It's actually fairly democratic for its for its time, though it never functioned as they thought it would because of the advent of political parties within just a couple of years of the uh, of the founding. So that's why the Electoral College, it was kind of a well, here we go. We'll try this. Do you think it still works today? Uh, I don't like the winner takes all system that uh, 48 states use. Each state gets to decide how it's going to allocate its electoral college votes. Um, 48 states have done it according to the winner takes all system. I much prefer the district system because it still maintains that state apparatus. The two Senate votes go to the statewide vote. But it also greatly decreases the chances of a split between the Electoral College winner and the popular vote winner. So it feels more democratic and more like each vote matters, but is not direct national election and preserves a place for the states. And I, I actually think the states are important. I see constantly kind of like flip it comments made online by people that are very um rabidly fixated on like a certain political viewpoint for example you stated the uh, from time to time the tree of liberty must be watered with the blood of patriots you know like people that like kind of like circle around the firearm community they love that one or um shall not be infringed right uh you talked about how simplistic the uh uh Bill of Rights spells out this freedom of religion and doesn't like have a bunch of codified rules and regulations around it. When people just toss these things out there, how does that make you feel when you've spent years and years kind of like looking at all the nuts and bolts around them and still admit that you don't know everything and have it all sorted out? Oh dear. Um, was that, I'm glad was that question fair. No, it makes sense. No, it makes a lot of sense. I'm just trying to pace my answer here. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm glad people are getting involved politically. I'm glad they're reading, uh, 
some important works from the founders. I think uh, dealing in absolutes in politics is extremely dangerous. And mm. if your entire political ideology is framed by this, the tree of liberty must be watered by the blood of patriots thing. I think that is uh, shockingly naive. Uh, and it's lack of understanding of how difficult it is to create a functioning society, a functioning government, how difficult it is to perpetuate it, and how foolish it is to ever resort to political violence because you can hardly ever go back to the ballot afterwards. So I, uh, I, have, I really have no patience for the it might be time to take up arms thing, that uh, ballots over bullets always. I agree with you on that. It's, it's, um, I so think not it's an always. easy, it's a, not always. Well, I mean, there are cases of civil war, but anyways, continue. Sure, sure, sure. But, but that's kind of the ideological difference between people. Well, I'm pushed to the wall. You don't know how it is for me. You don't know what I'm dealing with because of rules and regulations and, vaccine mandates or whatever people just fixate on a thing and for some people it's like it's it man that's all i got like i've got no more f's to give and i'm gonna that i mean we're not seeing it i think the january 6th thing people kind of like thought that was going to turn into something like that go ahead well yeah at this point, I would invite people to read the entire Declaration of Independence, which includes a very important section about prudence, about practical wisdom, that it is very imprudent to just revolt and overthrow governments for the slightest thing. It has to be that it is so impossible to continue living the way that you are living that you would rather die and condemn your family potentially to death than to continue to live under this regime. That and basically that alone. Just a copy of it's outside of my reach. I was going to grab it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, there's a reason why they go through the trouble of listing 27 or something uh, grievances ag against uh, King George. It's, they it's didn't not like... just say, we're pissed off. We're going to go to war. They're like all of these things, one after the other, after the other. And right. then you on top to of that, this. It. Yeah. Yeah. You have to justify it because the odds are you're going to fail. Revolutions tend to fail. And even when they succeed, they just so rarely actually lead to a freer form of government than what you had before. Usually a revolution ends and you just have another dictatorship. So mm. uh, prudence, people, prudence. I just watched this really well done documentary on uh, Argentina starting from pre-colonial time to present. And there's so many parallels that my neophyte brain made to America, but then so many not like how many times that the military overthrew the government and the craziness but the corruption and the way they handled their indigenous populations to expand and and uh some of those things but you like see like okay here is a perfect experiment in screwing up uh a beautiful place with beautiful people by by greed and uh lack of i guess maybe focus and and leadership lack of political prudence. No, I so agree. I'm not an expert on Argentinian history or politics, but from what I know, Argentina was a top 10 economy yeah. in the uh, early 1900s. Yeah. And it is Peronism, among other things, that just destroys that country. And uh, they just spent, and this and that. Yeah. I think at one point I, I saw in the documentary, like 30 to 40% of the population was employed by the government. He he uh, basically set up any farmer had to sell all of their crops to the government and then the government controlled all of the exports. And so then people are like, well, I'm not going to farm anymore. So then they had no food. And OK, so now we've got to bring all this food. And it was crazy. It was crazy. Yeah. You know, it, this just never works. Every time we try it, it doesn't work. No. Buenos Aires, they they said, uh, I think believe, believe it was called the Paris of South America. It was just so beautiful and still is from what I could gather i've never visited there but just the you could just see as you watch the story unfold like how is this possibly gonna go good what are these people freaking thinking 
Yeah, but I think there's something about the hopelessness involved and the militancy and the lack of political prudence and, and also the inequalities that led to those to those upheavals. But uh, yeah, I mean, Argentina has given us a lot. It's given us a great lesson of what not to do. And it's given us Lionel Messi, who's the greatest ever. So mm. lots to thank them for. Yeah, you, yeah, I heard some tongue in cheekness there. No, no, he actually is the greatest ever. You think He's so? my favorite. Oh, really? Oh, I, mean, I am, some of the I'm stuff that he's saying, some some of the things he said is are amazing, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, I'm I'm a wildly you know messy fan, so that, that's completely off topic. All right, I dig it. Something I deal with, I I guess I would say I combat it. We I'm an educator uh, in another space, and we talk about uh, this balance of rights and responsibilities that's used all the time in all kinds of places. So we teach people how to protect themselves with firearms. Misusing that can kill somebody, put you in jail, uh, ruin lives. And I, it seems like a lot of people have a, and maybe myself at certain times, have a very uh, romantic idea of our founders. Like these guys all like huddled up in, in bars and they planned to dump tea in the harbor and then they got together and like planned this beautiful revolution and, and, and then they all agreed and got along and did this amazing stuff and they all hated King George and they all loved being able to do whatever you wanted to do and they all hated taxes and making your own whiskey and it's like, man, I don't know. But talk about that a little bit. Yeah, no, it was so chaotic. It wasn't, uh, wasn't planned at all. A lot of it was accident. A lot of it is just chaos. They're constantly disagreeing with each other. There's very little consensus, actually, at any point during the founding uh, founding era, from you know 1776 all the way up until 87, when uh, we have the Constitutional Convention. They're just not agreeing on anything. So it, it is kind of a miracle, if I could use that word, that anything got done, that they, they agreed to anything and found some kind of found some kind of stability, but. You know, you spoke about that in your space as a as a firearms instructor, you talk about the need to balance rights and obligations. And I think it's really interesting that you're teaching these basic principles of basically social principles in a firearms training. But we lack that discourse in the political environment and how dangerous that is. There's a, uh, a book called The Book of Ob or The Bill of Obligations written uh, write by down. a Richard Haas, H-A-A-S, I think, that I assigned to my students in my public service class, just as an attempt to, it's an easy, easy book, just as an attempt to push back against a fixation on rights and a reminder of the responsibilities that come with, with rights and the responsibilities of citizenship. Uh, I think it's an important corrective, and I love that it's happening in these small ways in your classes. Well, I appreciate hearing that. Thank you. It's it's strange how little of this is ever taught anymore, or ever. I don't I don't remember ever in school being taught about the Federalist Papers or anti Federalist Federalist Papers. Maybe there was maybe a, a, a some cursory like in this paper they said this, but it was never a let's read this. Or um, and I went to private Christian school, so it. Uh, it's boring for most people, probably. It's about not. It's not like a, a lovely topic. Uh, it's not football or uh, I don't know, making money. It, it's it's like you know old dried bones and old papers and things. It's not it's not sexy, but it seems so strange now. Looking at like I don't recognize America. I lay in bed. I was in bed the other night, and I, I, sometimes I'm like, I don't even know if I want to be here anymore. I don't mean alive, but like. Like, what the heck is even happening around me? I don't, like, recognize. I'm watching friends fighting. I think we saw it all through COVID. You know, people drew these lines, like, you're either for this or you're against this. If you talk about anything uh, that doesn't follow this line, you're a bad person. You're the devil. And it seems like the same thing now. My brother was just here earlier and um, had shared something on Facebook, and he's he's a filmmaker. He, um, he's thoughtful. He wouldn't, uh, have put something on the internet that was like sensational or vulgar. And 
he was just commenting. He has a friend that's in North Carolina that was um, involved in delivering goods to help these people. And this guy shared a story of being stopped by some federal agency. So my brother shared that. People freaked out about it. And then Facebook took it down as like fake news. And it's like, well, that's really freaking scary that in this private space and a, it wasn't published in a newspaper it was on a i guess private facebook account that we have these organizations like stopping us and a family member and him another family member and him got into it that, that you know you're sharing fake garbage news and my brother's like well no a guy i served with in the army was actually there he told me like he sent me a video like it wasn't made up and i'm not even like talking about any of that mess going on there i hope those people get it sorted but just that we can't even talk about stuff that was a mouthful no no, no i know i know what you're saying yeah this this our, our inability to disagree or or even just to have meaningful conversations where there there may be differences of opinion i i know so many people in fact i don't think i know a person who hasn't lost a friend or been alienated from a family member over the last couple of years by politics and i can't think of anything more depressing than that politics is a thing that that drives us apart and i think in many ways it's because politics has become people's religion their mm. uh, their their understanding of their own righteousness or their own goodness as a human being i'm not from... i'm not methodist or catholic i'm liberal or conservative yes. or libertarian yeah yeah right and my my goodness as a person my virtue is attached to my having these political views and defending them and and casting you off and i yeah i i think it's uh it's sad and i agree with you sometimes i look around and feel uh feel a little homeless how do we fix that like i i remember years ago so my father was a minister and a uh, very conservative family. So of course, people like Bill Clinton or Hillary Clinton were the devil when I was a child. <laughs> I wish Bill Clinton was the president right now. And um, I remember Hillary, uh, the book, uh, uh, Takes a Village. And I remember my mother who had all these kids uh, was like, That's t that doesn't take a village. It takes a mom and a dad. It doesn't take a village. And as a kid, I was like, okay, it doesn't take a village. Like I quit telling me, mom, I'm, you know, I'm 12, leave me alone. And and I remember thinking, like, why is she so pissed about it? And and I remember her saying, like, it's not government's concern and this and that. But then I, and now as I'm older, I'm a grandpa now. I hope I talk about this all the time. Like, my lady was a 22-year um, kindergarten teacher. And, and I think about who's teaching our kids. Or if my kid falls down in the street and breaks their face open on the sidewalk who is there going to come and help them or if there is some uh not a medical emergency but two kids having a dust up on the playground what what adult is stopping them or who is teaching them how to behave uh and be polite and put your st stupid phone in your pocket and shut up we're in a restaurant like who who are all these people that are affecting children it's it's strange no i i agree with you i think uh we're we've we're lacking this kind of communal spirit, and I think it's healthy for us both politically and as humans to have uh, communities. And by the way, I believe in communal parenting. I like it when people <laughs> step in and tell my kids to stop running somewhere. I think it's great. Um, by the so way, so you wouldn't say, "How dare you try to correct my child?" No, I would tell my kids to listen to them. I think it's great. Um, the, I got to uh, interject one thing. My mother would drop me off at a friend's for a sleepover. She'd take me to the door. And, and so like, if you were my friend's mom, she'd be like, okay, Savannah, if he, if, if you need anything like the garbage taken out, tell him to do it. And if he acts up, feel free to give him a few whacks. And I'd look at my mom, like, what the hell you're telling, you're, you're telling her to hit me, ma? Like, and that was that. So my mom took the communal parenting to the, to the end. That's right. So you see, even your mom believed in, you actually need a community to raise a child. And what she's reacting against is, is kind of giving it over to government, but I, I don't think that means we need to like atomize ourselves. For example, my, my husband and I were headed out to uh, Istanbul. We had to stop in France and a bunch of people are converging at this escalator down. And this woman has a massive uh, uh, luggage case and like a two or three year old. And the two or three year old gets really, really scared at the top of the escalator and gets separated from the mom as she's going down. And she's yelling for people to help her 
because the kid is like right there and no one moves. No one, no one makes a move. And so I like elbow my way through the crowd because I'm seeing my three-year-old grab I the kid and help. take him down the escalator. And my husband and I afterwards were like, what has happened? How is, how is this an acceptable response that you're so afraid of offense that you wouldn't step in to help someone else's child? Yeah, I, I believe in uh, kind that's of That's a pretty well-studied phenomenon. Oh, that's is it? That's a pretty well-studied phenomenon. I have uh, performed CPR before in public places. And one time I've told this story a few times, and it's not a pat on my back, but it was I looked up on the ground and there was like 40 people still holding their forks in a restaurant watching and I'm telling somebody to call an ambulance and I know the waitress at the restaurant that's running the place and I finally I yelled at her like snap and it wasn't that they were like in fright it's just it's part of it's I don't want to get involved I don't want to get my clothes messy I don't want to touch some old person you know it's all these things I don't want to I don't want to do something that could get me legally in trouble and it, it's a very well documented thing and it's only gotten worse and worse and worse but i think it's changing i pulled over a couple um month or two ago on a side of the road in uh, ohio a really bad car crash had happened and i wasn't able to do anything other than help get this injured person off the road but like five people had stopped and i had the highest level of medical training there so i stayed until the ambulance showed up and uh I thought, oh, this is really cool. I'm like, any of you know this person? And there was like five cars that had stopped on a, like a major uh, busy road. And I'm like, that's really cool that these people had had done this. And maybe that's a regional thing. Maybe in you know certain areas that wouldn't have happened. It was fairly rural, but it was the busy interstate. But I am seeing that. That's all I was going to say. No, but this brings back up the the idea of civic virtue. You know, a civic virtue starts with knowing the name of your neighbor. Mm. Uh, in, in many ways, or or the, I don't know, political participation starts with knowing the name of your neighbor. Because if you don't know your neighbor's name, then you don't know their needs. You don't know how to be a good neighbor. And if you don't know their needs, you can't vote on any information except what's good for me and not what's good for us and uh, kind of a communal view of it. So that's something, by the way, the anti-federalists were really concerned about. They were worried that this new national constitution would allow for a a government so focused on self-interest and so large that you would lose the capacity for civic virtue, which is best done in small, tight-knit communities. And I don't think it actually has to be that way, but it kind of has to start with building back up the neighborhood. So that was guys like uh, Sam Adams, Patrick Henry, those dudes? Patrick Henry, yeah. So you think like the, the anti-federalist writers are like Cato, and uh, the Federalist Farmer and the governor of New York, who at that time was uh, William, William, no, George Clinton. The Clintons have always been with us. No idea if they're related, but mm. there you go, uh, a Clinton. And they actually had some fairly good arguments. They were wrong on the big thing, but some of their, their small critiques really haunt us to this day. Were they wrong or did they just lose? Oh, no, I think they were wrong. I actually think they were wrong. We needed a national constitution, both mm -hmm. uh, primarily for national security reasons, but also for the continuation of the uh, of the uh, American project. Uh, the idea of uh, of a liberal democracy was only possible with a national constitution. So I actually think they were wrong on the big thing. But I think some of their small critiques, potential danger of the judiciary, a House of Representatives that's too small, that one's maybe debatable, the uh, lack of, of inculcation of civic virtue and focus on self-interest, these things, okay, I could kind of see where they were coming from in terms of uh, these could be problems for us down the road. It was an experiment, right? It is an experiment. So they were saying, like, we'll take our best idea and let's throw it into the beaker and mix it up and see what happens. Right. They were arguing <laughs> right. about what ingredients to jam in there. Right. Although if the anti-federalists got their way, I don't think there would have been an experiment. I think uh, you think that's they would have they'd have ruined it. I don't think we would have had a national government had the anti-federalists had their way. I think so it would, would have. Yeah. Please. Oh, sorry. I think professor. it would have uh, devolved into thirteen separate states, and I think those thirteen separate states, based on their experiences during that critical period, 
uh, between the the uh, declaration and the uh, the constitutional convention may have also failed at the mm. in kind of this uh, without the collective. Yes, wouldn't yes. have had the ability to to flourish in France or Spain or England. Somebody would have come back in and taken back over control. Yeah, either external uh, failure or internal combustion, one of the two. So I, I really think the Constitution was our only chance at this project. Hmm. I like that. I kind of, I'm not poking at people because we're all ignorant to a thing till we know about the thing. But taxes, right? Nobody likes taxes. Nobody likes uh, regulation. Nobody likes red tape. I've spent. I'm a fifth generation carpenter by trade. I've not been in the trades for years. I. You just talked about traveling to places like Istanbul. You go around and look at some of these buildings and you're like, this would never be allowed in America, not because of, of anything other than it's unsafe, right? Or or we just saw what happened with um, the hurricane. There's beautiful hurricane uh, co building codes that now a home can withstand crazy winds and water. Didn't have that in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, et cetera. And so like, I don't want to, adhere to this stuff it's annoying well, that's great till your house blows away in a storm or burns up and burns the neighborhood down so like what this idea of my personal liberty uh something that comes up for me all the time is this is my land i want to shoot guns on it i have for years stopped my county uh i have helped stop the county from creating blanket ordinances against shooting firearms uh, in proper spaces, not like in a neighborhood, but like some guy owns 50 acres and that guy feels he has the right to do that. But then he pisses his neighbors off because he spends all Sunday busting clay pigeons and the neighbors can't enjoy a tea party or something. Where does my, this, this weighing of my rights and my ability to express myself and live free start to get, uh, outweighed by the collective by you know i pay all my money to taxes i'm not allowed to live i can't crank my radio and and enjoy music without getting the cops called on me like talk about that a little bit well what you've just described is politics that's how we make these decisions instead of your neighbor coming over and eradicating you as a way to solve the noise problem you try and solve this problem through the legal system or through uh county ordinances it's politics. And uh, your job is to convince people that your right to shoot your gun on your land outweighs their right to have a quiet, peaceful Sunday afternoon, though they are in no danger should you be shooting your gun. That's politics. Your job is to convince people that your your right outweighs their uh, I'm not, I'm not sure. I don't have the grand solution to how do you weigh the collective. So, so your job is really helping people understand that that is part of the process and the right or wrong isn't so much what you're concerned with, but how you arrive at the right or wrong or yes or oh, no, or yes, no, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I'm very concerned that we do the process, right? We don't do it by mob. We don't do it by force. We go through a pre-agreed upon political process to make these difficult decisions. Will I have an opinion in this? Do I think one side is more correct than the other? Yeah, and so I'll fight for that side. But uh, I don't have a, a, a grand solution to the, the problem of collective versus individual, except to say that's politics. How do you feel when people say we no longer have a say so and it's all just this like elite, uh, it's, it's lobbyists, it's it's huge corporations, it's big money, you don't have a say so in anything anymore. And if you say that you do, you're a liar. You're I don't delusional. It. No, I don't believe it. I don't think these people understand how important local government is and mm -hmm. how easy it is to access and influence local government. Not a lot of people vote in local elections. So uh, you say you have zero influence. Run for city council. Go change zoning laws in your city or ordinances on firearms or whatever it is that matters to you. And then tell me you don't have any influence. I, I think people are kind of politically impotent by choice and uh, and uh, then blame it on. Yes, there are elites. Yes, there are interest groups. But uh, a lot of that is simply because they're trying more and harder than you are. I 1000 percent agree with that. I found myself sitting with 
congressmen, senators, governors, and had no business. I remember thinking like, like the song says, like, how did I get here? And like, oh, I just thrust myself into it and there's not enough people doing things. And so in most jobs, like if you volunteer, somebody's going to put you to work and next thing you know, you're, you're like doing it. So I a hundred percent agree with that. Have you been involved in the political spectrum at all? In a very, very limited capacity. So I've worked on presidential campaigns just as a, just as like a volunteer, like send mm -hmm. me to a state and I'll knock on doors for you kind of a thing. That's what I did homecoming weekend of my senior year, uh, for example. But uh, no, I've been moving so frequently that I haven't been able to establish residency anywhere mm. uh, to uh, participate in kind of a, an elected capacity. But, you know, in the future, I'm interested in like city council. I'm very interested in that. I think local government is really cool. You can make a lot of, uh, have a lot of impact in ways people don't realize. So maybe someday. But uh, by the way, one thing you said about uh, people who just put themselves out there, find that they can have more of an impact and are more used than they realize. When people complain about political outcomes and then tell me they didn't vote, mm -mm. no, no, I, I really believe this. Complaining about politics is the sacred right of those who voted. If you went out and did the one thing you are guaranteed the right to do, get out and vote, and it didn't go, go your way, or you voted and the majority wanted this thing and then the state legislature overturned it, then you complain on Facebook all you want. Even if I disagree with you, I'll say hurrah for you. But if you can't even bother to get out your door and vote, but you can write a eight paragraph essay on Facebook about how government is broken. Just do the basics first, man. And then I'll read your eight paragraph essay. I'm not going to waste my time professor because of voter fraud. My vote doesn't count. That's another thing that I find really annoying. Every study has shown that voter fraud is vanishingly rare, though it occurs occasionally. In Who's paying cases. for those studies? The people that make the machines? Because that's what everybody says. Yeah, no. Everything from political scientists to independent uh, uh, newspapers to, yes, audits by those who make the, the machines to secretaries of states, like the Secretary of State of Georgia or the Lieutenant Governor of the state of Utah, who run deep investigations into the, the uh, security of state and local elections. If you are so unwilling to believe in anything but corruption, then that's what you're going to believe. Hmm. But uh, the evidence is just not with you on that, but I, I don't think I can change your mind. I'm not speaking to you. I agree with you. I have sat through a recount, a countywide recount of a very large populated county of a very tight campaign that I was helping manage. It came down to like a dozen votes out of several hundred thousand. So the loser called a recount. And so I sat and I watched every I watched the chain of custody of the ballots coming in and out of safes. And I, the thing that was, that I was impressed with is like, man, some $15 an hour person's got to commit felonies. Like, like, and it's not, and it's got to be in that race. It probably would have been relatively easy. Not, not relatively, because you still have to have it attached to a human and all that. But 15, 20 votes. It's not millions or thousands of votes. Somebody could have probably moved the needle. What was funny is once they recounted it, we gained like six more. And it was not that they, they were just um, not properly counted mail-in ballots. But after watching that and just seeing like the people, nice local people that are working a job for county government, for a county clerk, like I think I heard you talk about it that's why I brought it up. Does it happen? Yes. But is it like a system wide thing? Probably not. Yeah, probably not. The, the, uh, the thing that strikes me is I think increasingly there's a, a segment who will not be convinced by anything that is not exactly the world as they view it or force. Those mm. are the two things they will believe and nothing in between that there's truly really nothing you could do to fully convince them that they lost. I think that's really scary. So do you believe that the last presidential election, uh, not the one coming up, but the one that Biden won, you believe that he won? Oh, yes, I believe Biden won. He won in the okay. electoral college and he won in the direct popular vote. 
And there has been no verified evidence to the contrary. So, yes, I think Biden won. I don't disagree with you, but the amount of people that I love and respect that have told me opposite to that, it's, um, it's staggering. And to the point that you just made, you can offer information. And I don't, there's about a million things I don't know anything about. Uh, and even this topic, I'm, I'm still only know a little bit on, but it's like, show me some data and then show me the people that are doing this stuff. And I think it comes, a lot of times people just think, well, it's these machines. These machines are just moving zeros and ones and then nobody sees it. And it's just this magical like matrix thing where, and I laugh about it because you don't have to be a detective. If you look at what's going on right now in the, in the presidential race, if they could do that, Nobody would be running around just spending gazillions of dollars to win. They just run a little campaign, do a few little stump speeches, and then they'd move the, the needle into it, right? Yeah, no, I agree with you. I completely agree with you. I think, uh, uh, I, I don't know how we come back from election denial. I, I feel like it's a trend. You see it here in the state of Utah, for example. There's a governor. Uh, governor's race is kind of being upheaved right now by a, a candidate from the primaries who refuses to concede to the uh, current governor, Governor Cox. This kind of election nihilism is is spreading. And the thing that worries me is I don't know how you get back to it. I don't know how you regain trust in the political system. Trust in the system. Yeah. Once you've already broken all of these these norms that you concede and Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. I I uh, I don't know how you put that cat back in the bag. On the flip side, though, my brother that was with me today, we talked a little bit. I don't watch a lot of current events, but we were talking about this um, CEO of uh, Amber Crombie and Fitch that just got arrested. You know, crazy stuff. And my today's the uh, for those of you listening, the twenty third of October, twenty twenty four, which by the way is the forty first year since the bombing of the Marine Corps barracks. Uh, Go read about that. But anyway, oh. um, yeah, today's the anniversary of that. Oh. My friend wrote a really excellent book on it. Jack Carr wrote an excellent book on that. Who actually lives in your home state? Besides the point. My bro is saying you keep seeing all of like, like these people that were able to hide by money and power and connections. Like I am friends with my sheriff, my state's attorney. I've got a friend that uh, was a a local lawyer now he's a judge uh his wife is going to be our next elected state's attorney the current state's attorney is a, a good buddy of mine i see five times a week i can't get anything from any of them not that i would but like if i got a traffic ticket i wouldn't call one of them because not, not only not take right and wrong out of the equation the amount of um oversight and and uh it, like it would just it's not worth it pay the ticket drive cool you know like it's uh, almost impossible now to to have corruption and not have it immediately brought to light. Everybody films you, and it's um, like impossible to hide anything. So talking about like putting the cat back in the bag or the lid back on or whatever, in some ways, should we? Like did part of this experiment need to break down to put it back together? Oh, that's interesting. I don't think we ever needed to get to the point of major presidential candidates denying the validity of an election. That's not a point we needed to get to, because I don't know how you take the next step of anyone acquiescing and saying, yeah, I actually did just lose. By the way, this is one reason I respect Nixon. 1960, there's some potentially valid claims that he actually won that election based on how mm. you count uh, Democratic votes in uh, in the south which were split and uh he refused to challenge the election because again you can't play around with people's trust in the election system you can't do that because it's so hard to build back up and if you can't make decisions by ballots you've got to go to bullets so i respect that he said no even if there's a legitimate case there i don't have enough evidence of it and i'm not going to undermine this most sacred process which is how do we make decisions together? Mm, that's heavy duty. I read something that you wrote and you quoted a uh, German clergy, I believe, 
who said, silence in the face of evil is still evil. Not to speak is to speak and not to act is to act. That was how you closed out a piece that you had written a few years back. Um, you had quoted some C.S. Lewis in that, that uh, paper and some others. What's that mean to you? Of course, That's it's to me. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. Continue. No, I, I mean, it's a, it's the face value. I think it's pretty, this guy was talking about Nazi Germany. Uh, he's talking about all this crazy stuff going on, probably seeing people keep their mouth shut to not end up squashed by the bug of this craziness that was happening at the time. So I think it's easy, but what, why did that impress you that you captured that quote and, and how are you applying that in your life how, through your teachings? Like I'm sure you get tons of pushback knowing where you live, knowing the type of family you come from, like your comments about the election being authentic. I'm sure there's tons of people around you that are like, what the heck? No, that's true. You're um, institutionalized. You've bought yeah. into the. And you know what? I actually am an institutionalist. I'll take that happily. I'm a political institutionalist. Um, <laughs> uh, that is such a throwback uh, piece for me. Was it the Orthodox or was it the politics that of salvation? The Orthodox one, I believe. It's the Orthodox one. Yeah, so I, I uh, really related to that in, in kind of a, a religious sense uh, to what uh, Bonhoeffer, I don't know if that's how you say his name, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was, was saying. How do I apply that in my life? Well, just an example. Yesterday, I put up an Instagram post. This is a silly way of dem demonstrating this, by the way, but here's a, here you go about uh, voter fraud, because I felt like I just needed to use my incredibly small little voice to say, please accept election results. Just uh, please accept election results. Let's have a peaceful transfer of power or this whole system breaks down. And you know what? People are very unhappy with me in the comments. And it's such a small thing. It doesn't matter in the grand scale, right? I, I have such a small little account. But it's just. Uh, I, I want to tell you something to... on that. Oh yes. I didn't know who you were until about a week ago. Um, what you do does matter. A friend of mine, a retired U.S. Army colonel, a very lovely human, a very influential guy, a guy that's still very connected uh, through uh, what I guess would be the military-industrial complex through purchasing and design and that that stuff. Uh, sent me a link. He goes, hey, I think you'll like this girl. She says a lot of really cool stuff. And I was like, yeah, you know, whatever. You know, in social media, people are constantly sending you anything from a stupid thing with a cat, you know, dancing with a dress on to, you know, all, all kinds of stuff. So I watched it. I was like, oh, this is really cool. So he, he, he and I and actually another active duty colonel are constantly communicating about um, political things. And, and I, I, I dug through your stuff and that connected me to you. And now 50 something thousand people will download and listen to you. And so, uh, it, it does matter. And if they don't agree with you, that's fine. But like, if, if we don't tell people the truth and I don't always have the truth and you don't always have the truth that then what, like, should we just all just toe the line of elections are bullshit and there's no. There's there's nothing that's absolute anymore. Yeah, no, I think there is something that that same essay talked about uh, courage as like the chief virtue. I think that's that's the C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis quote. There's uh, there's something um, to that. And the end of the Bonhoeffer quote is God will not hold us guiltless. And why I bring that up is uh, I had that poster with that uh, phrase on my uh, wall also during those teen years when I had my wall of presidents. But I think it's something about the kind of life you want to lead. If you want to, uh, I think I have a duty to be civically involved and to uh, both in the family life and in professional life and among my friends and neighbors to be active and not to be passive and to use my agency, my, my rights in a productive way. And if not, I will be held accountable for that, both by my children and those around me, and and ultimately, if you believe in God, by a a, a God who I think uh, gives us liberty and holds us accountable for how we use it. It's pretty heavy stuff for a teenage girl to be thinking about. You didn't have a poster of uh, uh, I can't even think of anybody. Richard Marx. No, you're too young for Richard Marx. 
I don't know. I don't know who that is. He's a he's a singer, a very lovely singer. I was thinking of somebody that would be more your age, but you didn't have pictures of 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 uh, artists on your wall and things like that. You had this very heady, thoughtful discussion of a man that was trying to find his way in a war torn Nazi Germany. That's pretty cool. I know that you have an obligation that you have to get to, so I don't want to keep you and make you late. How do people find you? Oh, I am on uh, Instagram under Savvy Politics. That's S-A-V-Y Politics. And then I also co-host a podcast through the uh, Center for Constitutional Studies at Utah Valley University, and that is called This Constitution. My co-host and I, Matthew Brogdon, who's a, another professor of political science, dive into uh, various political topics. This season, it's all about the powers of the presidency. So those are the uh, two places you can find me. I love that. I am, uh, I've got like 18 more questions that I didn't get to ask you. So maybe in the future, you can come back. Cool. That sounds great. I had a great time chatting with you. I so very much appreciate you and and uh, respect the work that you're doing. You guys that tuned in, go check out the stuff that she puts up uh, almost daily, I think, on Instagram. There's a ton of great information there. And we hope to see you all again. Bye now. Visit our website, kerrytrainer.com, for information about classes held throughout the U.S., Kerry Trainer Apparel, and upcoming projects. You can also email us at training at kerrytrainer.com for information about setting up your own private course or speaking engagement. Training at kerrytrainer.com or kerrytrainer.com.